Now I'm going to tell you a story right here at the beginning of it, and some of you will not believe it. That's okay. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I hardly believe it. Happened to me. Happened to my wife, Deb. Uh, Mel and Lois are here. They know it happened. I don't know if Steve remembers it happened. Steve's here today. Uh, when we saw, Deb and I saw, what appeared to be the real Santa Claus. It was in Christmas 1979. See, so all of you smiling. You hear the story, you tell me, okay? It's 1979, Deb and I were about 22, 23 years old. It was Christmas Eve. Uh, we were at my father's house. It was late, it was not early. It was between eight and nine o'clock, pushing nine o'clock, it was late. Not the time you go visiting, right? Um, there was a, I don't know if there was a knock at the door but suddenly I looked up and it was this giant guy standing in the doorway. He was dressed like Santa Claus, he had a real beard, it wasn't fake beard, and it was the nicest Santa Claus suit I ever saw. Real boots, I'm not kidding around. The nicest Santa Claus suit I've ever seen in my life and a sack over his back. And he filled the doorway, giant of a man. He says, ho, 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 and then he pulls the sack off of his back, and he says, uh, I have a few gifts for the kids here, and he calls the kids by name. He pulls out gifts out of the bag that are not wrapped, and he hands them to the kids by name, and uh, after he gave them all these gifts, he wished us all a Merry Christmas, and he turned and he went out the front door like he came in. We didn't have a chimney. <laughs> After he left, my brother was there, he's about 31, and I was like 21, 22, 23, somewhere in there. And uh, my dad turned to my mom and said, who was that? Because he thought she'd set something up. And my mom turned to my dad and said, I don't know. I thought you knew and asked him to come. About that time, Ray and I looked at each other and we jumped up and ran outside. <laughs> Went out in the front yard and we live on a long straightaway. He had not been out of the room more than three minutes. There was nothing out there. No car, no sound of anything, nothing. In fact, the whole family ended up outside looking around for this guy that nobody knew who he was with the real beard that had stopped and dropped gifts off by name to kids he couldn't possibly have known. So we stood around outside wondering what in the world just happened. You can make of that whatever you wish. I know most of you think I'm a nut anyway. So, we live in a skeptical society. We've all heard false claims. We've all heard fraudulent things. We've all been lied to. So we struggle. We struggle with believing anything that seems out of the ordinary. Miracle on 34th Street, the one from 1994, there's an old guy standing there with his grandson and says, you know, because Chris Kringle's standing there and he says, my grandson thinks you're Santa Claus. And he just smiles. He leans over to the boy, whispers in his ear, I am. The further show goes on to show Susan and uh, Karen talking to each other. That's a mother and daughter. She's the guy, a lady in the story that puts on the basically M Macy's Thanksgiving Day and so they're discussing, could he really be it? I've seen some things. Could he really be the Santa that he claims to be? And she's explaining why she doesn't think that could be. But And then there's later another discussion where she's the little girl is talking to Chris and she gives him this unbelievable request for what she wanted for Christmas, something that even Santa Claus probably couldn't pull off. And he sa she says to him, well, if you're the real Santa Claus, if you're the real Saint Nick, you should be able to do it, right? 
And then the end of the story is about how he ends up being on trial for whether or not he's the real Santa Claus or whether he's crazy. And the judge in this particular story pulls out a dollar bill and says, you know, our dollar bills say, in God we trust, and I can't prove that there's a God. I can't bring him out for here, so what's the harm of somebody believing that he happens to be the real Santa Claus and he lets him off the hook? And that's the end of that story. But you know, I want to draw your attention to something far more unbelievable than that. I know you're sitting here and you're going, wait a second, you ain't telling me you... I want to tell you a story that's even far more unbelievable than that. Who exactly is that child laying in that manger? Who is that? These are astonishing claims. Could it be? Or is he just a nice man with a beard? These are staggering implications, my friend. What if that baby in that manger is the savior of the world and the son of the almighty God? And not just a nice little story. There are no safe choices. You say, well, you can take it or you can leave it. Really? You can? Matthew 16 verse 15 says, Who do you say that I am? You need to make a decision, he's saying. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body. You're going to be judged. If this story is true, you're going to be judged in light of it. It isn't a case of, oh, I can take it or I can leave it. He cannot be just a nice man with a beard. See, the choice number one is, here's your choice. You've got two choices. Choice number A or is... If you don't believe he's the Son of God, according to him, you die in your sins. John 8, 24. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Choice B, your other choice. Well, I just believe he's a crazy old guy with a beard, so he's a blasphemer and an idolater, and if I say he's the Son of God, and I get up in front of people and I claim that, I'm a blasphemer and an idolater if it's not true. Listen to John 10, verse 34. For blasphemy, and because you being a man, make yourself God. So th that's your choice. Do you realize you're in trouble if you're wrong one way, and you're in trouble if you're wrong the other way? It's not a take it or leave it kind of thing. So he's either the Lord, or he's a liar, or some kind of lunatic. Or, you can look at this, I know some of you follow, have read C.S. Lewis books. This is from Mere Christianity. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Basically, he's saying this. He hasn't given you that easy choice, or he's just a nice guy. He's just a nice guy in a beard that said some things. It's not that easy. You'll look down here. It's basically you can't go there. He's either a lunatic on the same level as a poached egg because he claims to be the Son of God. Look at the bottom part of that. But let us not come with a patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Either he's a liar and the worst thing that's ever happened to this planet and they should have killed him or he's the son of God. There's no middle ground. He's a nice guy. So make up your mind which way you want to be you got to make a decision. So let's review these astonishing claims because there's staggering implications from them. Okay, number one. Can we conceive that lying in the manger was the word of God? That's what he says in verses 1 through 5. I won't reread it. I hope you've got turned open in your Bible to John chapter 1 and look at verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God. Dr. James Allen Francis is the guy who first penned that thing that has been repinned and repinned and repinned and repinned since then. And a lot of people have claimed that they're originator of it. But he's the guy who in a sermon way back in Los Angeles back in 1926 wrote One Solitary Life. He ended his words with, when we try to sum up his influence, talking about Jesus, all the armies that ever marched, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned are absolutely picayune in their influence on 
mankind compared with that of this one solitary life. So he's saying that they're worthless comparatively. I believe he was the Word of God. But you've got to make up your mind. What do you think? Do you believe he's the Word of God? Why do I believe he's the Word of God? Because of how this has changed this. It's changed me. And maybe it hadn't changed you, but it's changed me. So I believe that lying in that manger was not just a little baby. It was the living Word of God. Second little thing I want you to look at is we, can we, I don't know if we can, can we believe that lying in the manger was literally the light of God? I know some of you follow. If you look at verses 6 through uh, 13, you'll see that he's called the light over and over again. He, John wasn't the light. He bore witness to the light. This is the light and the life. Uh, the light was the light of men. And so literally he was the light. John Ortberg Jr. has some interesting writings on this point right here. He, he preaches in a mellow church in California, about 4,000 people. And he, he was talking about a historian, a historian named Pelkin who said, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, that is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. Why is that so? What is it? that Jesus taught that was so different. Let me give you six things that changed the world. And if you're ignorant of this, you should not be ignorant of this. First thing he changed is children. Now before Jesus came, you may not realize this, but children were routinely left outside and if they didn't want anymore. It's still done in some countries. China still does it. There are still babies. If you don't want the child, you just take it outside in the cold weather and you leave it out there and it dies of exposure. That was common in the world where Jesus came. We can't afford another mouth to feed. We just leave it outside. It'll be dead in the morning and it's okay. It was particularly the case whenever they had a little girl and they didn't want another one because they couldn't make anything out of the little girl like they could the little boy. So they killed the little girl by just letting her be there. Or they would sell them into slavery. That was very common, to sell your children as a slave. And the whole idea under Jesus was so forbidding that after Jesus, suddenly orphanages, which did not virtually exist at all before Jesus, orphanages and the idea of being godparents suddenly came in. Uh, a Norwegian scholar named Bake simply said this. He wrote a book on this topic. He says, When children became people, the birth of childhood in early Christianity. He says he claims that the world did not treat children as people until Jesus arrived. But that's not the only place the world's changed. The world's changed on education. You may think that the world's always been dedicated to education. Well, it has in a way, in a way it was not. And that is that, yeah, there were people who studied, but it was only for the elite you had to be rich to study. You had to be rich to go to school. There was no school for the average people. In fact, and this is what led to monasteries, and you may not know this, but Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, all of those schools actually began as an effort to teach people about Jesus. That's right. And so efforts to make them understand the love of God. But it went further than that. In Massachusetts, in 1647 in Massachusetts, they passed what was called the Old Deluder Act. Have you ever heard of this? The Old Deluder Act was this, that children, if they're going to grow up right, they need to be educated because the devil the devil is so cunning that he will deceive you when you're a child. And this is what the actual uh, council of the whole state proposed. And this is the idea that wherever there was a township of a certain size, there had to be a schoolmaster. You say, well, that's not, that is how the educational system grew in the United States of America. The reason you had a public education is because the old Deluder Act, without education, they said you were more subject to be overcome by the devil. Education is the cure for the devil. That's what they taught. 
And then the third thing, not only education and children, but compassion. You may not realize this, but before Jesus came on the scene, the idea of compassion as we know it did not exist, either for the poor or the sick. There were no such things as institutions for lepers. But after Jesus came, suddenly institutions for lepers developed into modern day hospitals. They were called hospices and they spread across the nation. In fact, the, the Council of Nicaea uh, decreed that wherever there was a cathedral, there had to be a hospice in that town. And so you see hospitals springing up. And the reason hospitals began was not because secular society and some atheist or some other person decided, well, we need to take care of sick people. It's because of the influence of Jesus Christ and churches that hospitals sprung up all over the world. You have hospitals you can go to today. It was Jesus that started that. Compassion for the sick and the poor. And then there was a huge change in humility. The world was a different place regarding humility when Jesus arrived. When Jesus came on the scene in the ancient culture, what was valued was courage and power and wisdom. Those are the things. If you were wise, you were valuable. If you were powerful, you were valuable. If you were courageous, willing to go into battle, that was great. But Jesus taught something else. He taught that we needed to be compassionate, but more than that, we need to be humble. In fact, Cicero said rank must be preserved. And so society was divided into, not the haves and the have not, but coach and first class. That was it. Everybody was either first class, which is a very small number of people, and the rest were coach. There was no middle class of anything. It didn't exist. In fact, Plutarch goes on, he wrote a book called How to Praise Yourself Inoffensively. That'd fit on our shelves today, wouldn't it? How to praise yourself without offending everybody in the room. Historian John Dixon said this, It is unlikely that any of us would aspire to this virtue, talking about humility, were it not for the historical impact of the crucifixion. Our culture remains cruciform long after it stopped being Christian. So even today we value humility in American society. That didn't exist before Jesus. Nobody had that. That wasn't a part of anybody's society. In fact, it was frowned upon. But more than that, forgiveness. Forgiveness was not a part of the world culture until Jesus came on the scene. You've heard Conan the Barbarian, right? You know Conan. Well, actually, Conan's kind of quoting something that Genghis Khan said when he was asked, what is best in life? And the answer was to crush your enemies, see them driven before your eyes, and hear the lamentation of their women. But Jesus gave us a different view. Jesus said that you should love your enemies. Uh, Jesus said that you should find a way to get along with them. Hannah Arndt, uh, first woman appointed to a full professorship at Princeton, which is not a shady little school, said, the discovery of the role of forgiveness in the realm of human affairs was Jesus of Nazareth. Before Jesus, this idea of forgiveness was looked at as weak. You didn't do it. You just didn't do it. And now we see the strength in it. And then finally, humanitarian reform changed. Now you may not be aware of this. You may think that we've all just arrived at this by ourselves. But humanitarian reform has changed radically. The inclusion of women in society did not exist as a concept before Jesus arrived on the scene. In fact, I'll go even further. The idea of slaves. Now slaves made up of the Roman world at least one third of the population was enslaved. In Rome itself, over 60% were slaves. Slave was a part of the world. And so they went to church and what was really strange is that they might find uh, a slave owner washing the feet of a slave. It was different, my friend. In fact, one text in, uh, instructs bishops to not interrupt worship to greet a wealthy attender, but to sit on the floor to welcome the poor. The Apostle Paul said it this way, now there, now there is neither Jew nor uh, Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, but all are one in Christ. Before Jesus, women didn't sit with the men. What you're seeing right now, look around you. Women didn't sit next to the men. It wasn't allowed. Men engaged in worship. Women sat over there if they came at all with the kids. That's the way services were conducted up until Jesus. Women weren't included. Look around you now and you'll see there's more women in this room than there are men. 
So it's changed. If women are aware of it. There has been a radical reform. In fact, Thomas Cahill says this. This was the first statement of egalitarianism in human literature. That just means of equality. If you want to talk about how people have become equal, it isn't due to civil rights activists. It's due to the Lord Jesus Christ inspiring civil rights activists. That's what changed the world. So I believe he was the light of the world. And I know he's the light of the world because before him, what I just mentioned was just darkness. It was just darkness. And can we really believe that in the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of the manger, then we need to believe that that little baby laying in that little manger was the light of the world. But then let me give you thirdly, can we receive the lying in the manger was the grace of God. Verses 14 through 18, he talks about how grace upon grace, that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, in pagan society, there was this concept of propitiation, but it isn't the biblical concept of propitiation or atonement. In pagan propitiation, the gods needed to be propitiated because they were grumpy and capricious. You didn't know what they were going to do next. He didn't have any idea. So humans looked around for a way to, to keep the... Because the, the, the pagan gods didn't care if humans lived or not. That's what everybody believed. They weren't anything. You know, humans don't matter. So we kill off a thousand of them. It doesn't make any difference. So there was no concern for humans until they made the gods mad. That's what the people believed. And it was up to mankind to find a way to propitiate, to, to appease their God so that they quit killing everybody off. Humans would find something that they thought that the gods would like and they'd offer them as a sacrifice and hope that would change the gods' mind. They'd give them sweets or they'd give them meat or they'd offer pain and they'd cut themselves or they'd offer them blood and they'd literally sacrifice somebody and pull their heart out of their chest. That's what pagan beliefs gave us. Bribery. You bribe a god to get him to do what you want to do. Well, what we see is God requires propitiation, but it's not because he's moody or easily provoked. It's because he's just and he responds to what's done wrongly. Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed uh, in, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Yes, God gets angry, but it's with evil not with just wants to punish you for no reason. And who cares? And I mean, who really cares? He cares because he does more than that. He's, it's not man's initiative that actually brings about this propitiation. Man wasn't left to figure out what in the world made him happy. God told him. What, told man what would make him happy. And then he does more than that. He even provides the sacrifice himself. You remember Abraham. God will provide himself a sacrifice. Listen to Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So he'd already done it for it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls, he says. So not only did he give you a way to propitiate, but he explained how you could get there. And then what kind of sacrifice, though, brings about biblical propitiation? It's not a bribe. We're not bribing God. You can't. You and I can't do anything. You put money in the plate? I didn't do it. You came to church today? I didn't do it. You lived a godly life all your life? I ain't going to do it. Why? Because you did wrong. Done wrong. How am I going to propitiate with God? How am I going to appease Him if I've done wrong? Guess what? You can't. You can't do it. In fact, uh, Stott said this, God himself gave himself to save us from himself. Romans 3, verse 23, beginning says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sin 
that was previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. That's how we're saved. Uh, Hebrews 2 verse 17 puts it this way, in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Who made propitiation? God himself made it. And 1 John 2 verse 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world. 1 John 4 verse 10 puts it this way. In this is love. Not that we loved God, not because we were so good and we just loved Jesus, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the appeasement for our sins. God did it all. So I believe he was, that little baby laying in that manger, was literally the grace of God. Amen? And so, I know he sacrificed himself for me to save me from me. How can we believe? You just make a choice after you see the, the evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. I want to show you a, a guy. That's the next, that's the whole thing. Some of you may remember him. Uh, Daryl, the Miracle Man Perry. Do you remember Daryl Perry? He uh, played for uh, the Gators. I know some of the Seminoles will boo at this point, but he played for the Gators back in the 80s. He was a fullback, uh, and he turned financial advisor. It was about 4 o'clock on Thursday, March the 15th, 2007, when he died. Daryl Perry died. Uh, and he was dead for seven minutes, seven. They'd say, you know, four to six minutes, your brain's gone. You won't come back. There's no oxygen getting to you. You won't come back. And so they put him in stasis and uh, thought he wouldn't come back. Nobody believed it. None of the doctors, the doctor said, you need to get ready to cut off the machines, he was on machines. But his wife kept praying and uh, but they all said, even if he comes back, he's, he'll be a vegetable. He won't be able to do anything. Well, he did come back. I won't tell you the whole story simply because of time. But he regained consciousness one day when the neurosurgeon came in, 11 days after it happened to him. And he said, uh, Mr. Perry, open your eyes. And he opened his eyes. And his wife came in and he leaned over at, him, at her and mouthed, I love you. They thought he wouldn't even remember anybody. Not only did he remember everybody, but he's come back. He said this, they said I would never talk, never know my family. Well, I've proven them all wrong. I'm riding a bicycle. I walk every day and my memory is off the chart. Nothing but God's power could bring all this to pass. He said, and with a slurred speech, slightly slurred, I'm not a quitter. I will never quit. As long as God gives me breath, I'm in the game. Now, what's that makes this interesting? This story is the reason I'm bringing it up. Is he said that months before he died, something whispered to him, said, you're going to die. And you're going to be an example of God's power. He says that happened to him. And it happened to him three times. And the last time was he got this word. Son, it's time, and he died the next day. Nothing happened that day, the next day, and they declared him dead, and he came back. Now, folks, I don't know all the story. I'm just what I read. I can't prove that. What I'm trying to get you at is we serve a God that can do anything. God can do anything, and so when you say, well, could this be really the Son of God, Santa Claus is nothing. This is big stuff. Could he really be the Word of God? Could he really be the light of God in this world? Could he really be the manifestation of God's grace to this world? Amen. Not only could he be, he is, and I believe it with all my heart. Amen. And if you're here today and you're doubting what God can do, I'm telling you, there are miracles sitting around you. There are people alive in this room because God has healed them right now. 
I'm telling you, I know them. I can name them off of a list right now. I believe that God can do anything. And so if you're sitting there saying, I don't know if I believe, well, maybe you need to make a decision. Because that's what faith really is. It's a decision. Would you decide that you would be free from the burden of sin? Because there really is power in the blood. Would you be free? Would you believe that Jesus Christ is the Word of God? Would you confess that? And would you repent of your sins and then be baptized this day? It's your choice. What a great thing to do at this moment. Won't you come if you need to while we stand and while we sing?